Welcome. I'm Kelvin Hahn, you your host, and you're watching Creative Current here on LAArtStream.com. Folks, there's still something that America does better than anybody else, and that's movie making. And nowhere is that more clear than when we manipulate the picture. This is called visual effects. And uh, you might not have even noticed it, but think about how uh, the picture has been manipulated in films like Tree of Life, Avatar, Sucker Punch, Tron the Legacy, uh, Tropic Thunder. Have you heard about some of these films? Uh, uh, Golden Compass, Superman, X-Men, X-Men 2, Constantine, Braveheart, Batman Returns. My guest today has been instrumental in working on all of these films. Uh, the list goes on, Seventh Sign, Star Trek, Blade Runner, Back to the Future. You've heard of some of these films. Uh, I am sitting here with an Academy Award winner. Uh, some people call, a lot of people call a guru of visual effects uh, here in Hollywood. A master. It is my pleasure to welcome Michael Fink. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Sorry about yeah, that the lengthy guru thing. That's well, big, yeah. well, I read that online. <laughs> I know. I read I a know. lot about it you was online. In the Hollywood Reporter, and then it spread like a virus. It's like right. Everybody, because right. it's funny. <laughs> then TMZ picked it up, and then and, and then right. it was out. It was out. So I'm sorry about that lengthy uh, uh, introduction, but you you've worked on all of this stuff. You've had an amazing career. Uh, you're our first Academy Award winner, uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, sitting here with me. So you're adding a lot of class. You're the benchmark for us right now. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll try to hold it up. Um, you know, I'm going to start uh, uh, this conversation by m maybe uh, uh, offending you a little bit. I was having a, uh, a conversation with uh, another person a couple of days ago, uh, an artist, somebody that knows a lot about film and art, and, and they were saying uh, how uh, the, the, there's too many visual effects in films nowadays. What happened to people that just sit around and talk in country estates in British uh, uh, right. language. Um, and m I argued with this person, my thinking is that visual effects are the storytelling uh, nowadays in, in our films. They are the metaphors for uh, emotions and uh, story points and, and, and like that. Uh, what is your feeling about that? And uh, I, you know, visual effects when they're well done, yes, are exactly that. Well, visual effects should be that, can yeah. fully integrated into a film become the story, and the story becomes it, and you can't, you don't think about it. You watch the movie. Harry Potter was like that this year. To a great extent, Hugo was, and Hugo won the Academy Award. Sure, sure, effect. sure. If you watch them, you, you just watch the story unfold, and the visual effects are there helping tell the story, and they're very much a part of it, but you don't. You're not trying to, you don't get hit in the head with it. Okay, now, Mr. Guru, uh, 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 I, I, I've read some of uh, the things that you've said about about visual effects. Uh, I, I, you you uh, you say a lot of things about um, subtlety, mm -hmm. right? Visual effects uh, enable us to defy logic mm -hmm. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, when do you think it, it's helping, and when do you think it gets in the way? When does it fail? At, at, at what point, you know, we want to push our idea of logic mm -hmm. in a film. We want to make magic happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, what's the trick? You're the guru. What's the trick of well, making that work I, and not going too far? There's an interesting phenomenon that happens in movies, especially big visual effects movies. Yeah. Where the people making the movie sometimes get so excited about the visual effects that they're doing and they're having such a good time, believe me. It, the work is backbreakingly hard, unbelievably long hours for months, years on end. Um, but For you. For me. And, and for the people who work on the Absolutely. show. Absolutely. Yeah. And for the director and the producers. And it can take them years. And I was on Golden Compass for nearly two years, 22 months. For which you won an Academy Award. Right. And, and we'll, we'll talk yeah. about that. And a number of films for 18 months, 19 months, 20 months. Right. You know, so you're on them for a really long time. And you're, it's grueling. 14-hour days, six, seven days a week, it's, and you're constantly being bombarded with things that change, everything. So you're, you're in this, in the middle of all this, and you're, but you're doing these things, you're creating these wonderful images. And so you're having a great time, and one of the things where it goes wrong is that the directors and the visual effects supervisors and the producers and everybody else are so loving what they're doing 
they're forgetting that they're not really moving the story along anymore. Right. And it's like watching an action movie where you see, a, you know, it's a good action movie, and you see some good dialogue, and, stuff, and then a fight starts. Sure. And when the fight starts, the movie stops. Right. And you wait for the fight to end so the movie can start again. Absolutely. And that happens a lot in visual effects. And that's when visual effects fail. They don't fail because they aren't high quality. Right. The work can be superb. They're not integrated. They're not part of the storytelling. Right. They, they have no purpose. They don't really, right, exactly. Right, right, right. right. They're, they're excessive. They're too much. When I walked out of the Bake Off the mm -hmm. event at the Academy just before the nominations this year, and we screened 10 movies, and I was saying to my friends, okay, we've done this. Let's start telling really good stories. Thank you. You know, let's do that now. Because clearly we can do anything. So let's just start focusing on the story and stop this spectacle mongering kind of Sure, effect. sure, sure. You know, I, I, it's not up to us, of course, because you know, when Transformers, well, whose box office is hugely driven by the visual effects, does hundreds of millions, billions of dollars worldwide, those movies are going to get made. I mean, you can... Whether you like the story or you don't, Michael Bay knows how to make a film that reaches a very large part of the market. He certainly does, but Michael Bay is also not a bad storyteller when no, put not. to task. No, he can tell a great story. The yeah. Island was a well-told story, yeah. uh, and, and you know, and had some tricks and mm. visual uh, magic going on, and and, and all of that. Uh, uh, like all of us, he's he you know he's making products that sell. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, okay, you were talking a little bit about Golden Compass. You won an Academy Award about that. Mm -hmm. um, you were also talking a little bit about the people that make these films. What kind of films get a... What, what, when does your work get an Academy Award? Uh, why is it that you got an Academy Award for Golden Compass? Um, that's a tricky question. Well, I, I, I'm so, trying to tie it in with, so, yeah, uh, with, with the, the people that make the films and, 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 right. and, 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 and how they are able to empower well, you as a visual effect generally artist. Generally and historically, if you go back through the last 50 years of filmmaking or so, um, Visual Effects Academy Awards uh, are usually won by films that are done by major directors or directors right. with a lot of clout. Zemeckis. Yeah. And Zemeckis and, uh, and Spielberg, Spielberg and right. Lucas. Lucas right. And, and Peter Jackson, and, you know, people of that. The that, guys with the clout. The guys with the clout. Get the money. Right. Yeah. yeah. They have the money. They have the clout. They can support the visual effects people. They understand how to work with visual effects people. Um, Zemeckis is one of the finest directors in live action melding visual effects and live action. His films I use in my classes all the time as examples of perfect use of visual effects. Why? Tell me why. Why? Why does? Why is he so successful at that? Uh, What's the deal? I don't deal? know why, but mm. he understands. He just he gets understands it. it. He gets it. Right, right. So his shot in contact of the young Ellie, the girl who played the young Jodie Foster character, yes. running up the stairs after her father collapses on the floor. Right. You hear him collapse. You never really see him. You see a constellation laid out in popcorn on the floor, and she and he. She runs down the stairs, discovers him, starts to run up the stairs to get the medicine from the medicine cabinet. And as she runs down the, runs down the hallway upstairs, and the camera's pulling her back, and you're looking right. down the hallway, and she's running, and the camera's doing this, mm -hmm. and you're going back and back, and she's starting to move slow motion. It's, it starts to feel, if you're a viewer, like you're having a dream when you can't run fast enough. Absolutely. And she's starting to move in slow motion, and all of a sudden, she starts to reach out, and the camera keeps pulling back, and you're in a reflection in a medicine cabinet mirror in a bathroom. And then she reaches up, opens the medicine cabinet mirror. So suddenly you go from this objective point of view of her running forward, which is slightly subjective because sure. of the overcranking. Then you're inside. Then all of a sudden you're, you're, you can't possibly have pulled back this yeah, hallway yeah, into yeah, yeah. a reflection in a mirror in a bathroom. Right. And then to see her reflected in the mirror while you're also seeing her reach yeah. for the cabinet, her hand, reach for the cabinet. Then she reaches, she gets the medicine, and she runs away. The cabinet slowly swings closed and shows a little shelf in the bathroom with a picture of her with her father and some other stuff, and it fades to white. So you've just killed off the dead. There's so much storytelling. There's so much storytelling in that. 
That's, that's great. It's you've amazing. told you've told the whole background of the Every, the relationship. Right, right? The whole, you with set her it father, all up. The, the whole sense of what that loss means sure. to her. You've done it all in one shot. It's a visual effect shot. And until I start to talk about that shot, people who've seen that movie even multiple times said, "Oh, I never even thought." You about didn't it. even get it. Yeah. Right, right, right. That's the kind of subtlety that you're talking That's about. Talking it doesn't about. hit you over the head, but it made right. that shot, and it makes the storytelling, right. the, 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 the sense of movement, right. the sense of isolation, right. being Everything inside of the, the psychologically it. inside of the character. Yeah. That's all you. Yeah. That's all your, yeah. your team and yeah. your work. But that was That's Bob's. I didn't, I didn't work on that shot. So okay, yeah, 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 yeah. do a little work on the film, but I didn't do that. Okay. Um, uh, but and, good, uh, good point to make. Yeah, but it's a brilliant shot, and, and those well, those kind of directors win Academy Awards. Sure, okay? sure. Uh, for visual effects, for their team that did it, did the right, work, right. and and quite often, if they don't win the awards, they're nominated. They're they're honored quite a bit for doing that. Generally, that's the way it's been. And then, but in I, Golden I, Compass, then you Golden won the Compass. Go it was an entirely different situation. Right. In this film, unlike any other film I can think of, um, the shots were all finaled by me. They weren't final by Chris because he wasn't there. This um, was the point that I was kind of making: is that you kind of took the helm right. of this of the of the film yeah. at a certain point, yeah. and uh, well, perhaps that's in some respects. Yeah, well, I don't in some respects. That I mean, there were, I know you there don't. So but many other people involved, of course, trying to get this thing out the door. Um, but the director but of you're photography the was was released from the movie. Sure. And so there's a thing called a digital intermediate where the film is color corrected and made to look pretty. Right, right. Um, that was left to me. Then I suddenly took over that as well. So that's usually the director and, yeah. the, and the director of photography. But there was no director or director of photography. So I took over the DI. So the final result, what you see in that movie, and the reason I'm so proud of it, was basically what you see is what my team and the editor, Peter Honess, did. Sure, sure, And Kevin sure. Tent, who came in and helped a bit. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and kind McLeod, of produced in a, in a way at that point, yeah. maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to even say that, that I think that that's, that's why you get an Academy Award for that, is that your, your peers respect that kind of work, and they see the, uh, how long you spent on that and the work that you put in that film. Yeah, I don't... I don't know that anybody knew uh, anything of the story of the making of that. Movie. Oh, is that right? It's only after the making, after the release of the film, um, that Chris was public about, you know, that he had disagreements with with Newline. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, that I've said anything. Nobody. It's long after, and there were, you know, a number of. There's a whole story around that. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. It's just, it's, it's amazing to me, the, the, the epic heroics that, that really that go on every day in this town to get this art made, you know, and, and, and for a film to come to fruition and, and to get shown in the theater, it's just, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a creative miracle, right. you, you know, right. uh, when it comes down to it. Um, it. It's a tough thing to do. What, what got you involved in this? Uh, how did you how did you get into this work and and uh, what what's your passion about this work? I mean, why, after, why do you do it? After the army and managing money in San Francisco, after all that, wow! Why did I do this? Wow! So you, so you, so you you spent some time in the army. I had a career. Yeah, yeah I didn't. Yeah. That was not my career. Yeah, um, yeah, I was drafted in '66. I went in the army, got out, drafted February '66. Interesting time to get December's. drafted into the army. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Difficult time. December '68. I uh, went to work for a division of the Bank of America. Interesting. Managing money, because I was a, had a business degree. Up in Northern California? Uh, yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, sure, sure. That's the head of the... Yeah, where the headquarters, yeah, headquarters, headquarters are. Yeah. And uh, did that for a couple of years. Took a leave of absence, went to art school, where I'd always wanted to go. But I, yeah. never, you know, I got my degree from my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, went to art school, came down to L.A., got a master's at CalArts. You went to Cal Arts. Yeah, I went there for a year. Oh yeah, I got nothing done because you know you're uh, uh, you're. Had a good time though. I well, think. you know, see, you're. Uh, I, I was living in the dorms, and your dorm room window it, it faces out to the uh, uh, to uh, uh, to the pool there, right. and 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 the modern dancers they all sunbathe nude right. out on the pool at Cal Arts. Right. It's a tradition there. Yeah. I got nothing done in oh. the year that I was yeah. there. Yeah, I, I absolutely learned nothing. You obviously learned a lot more. I, uh, I was one of the guys down by the pool. 
Oh, there you go. That's a smart place to be. Yeah, yeah that's so, the only no, place to they, be. They, the CalArts was great, and I, I left there, and I was a starving artist in L.A. Right. And I had friends who worked on films. They'd work for six months on a movie, and then six months back in their studio making art, and then six months on a movie, and six months. And I thought that was a good thing to do because it was a way for me to make a living and save up enough money to survive for six months where I could just dedicate myself to my work. Right, right, right. And I did that uh, once. I did, <laughs> I, I did that once. I went uh, to work on the China Syndrome in December of 1977. And, uh, and I fell in love with film business and basically never looked back. Wow, it's been an incredible career. Yeah. And uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about where you think uh, visual effects is going, uh, the future of visual effects. Uh, we're moving a lot into 3D now, mm -hmm. all right? Um, um, do, you, do you think that storytelling is, is, is going towards 3D a lot? Uh, I personally think it's too much information for a lot of stories. I have a wonderful cartoon from the New Yorker that I keep, which is a guy sitting at a desk, yeah. looking at a man standing in front of the desk, and he says, <clears throat> the script is great. Can you rewrite it for 3D? Uh -huh. you know. Right, right. That, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's like our that. business right now. That, that's, uh, that's the state of our, but, our industry. Uh, you know, visual effects in 3D uh, have an uneasy alliance. Uh, right. There's... There, is, there are people like me who like 3D and enjoy making 3D movies, but in my heart, I feel it distracts from the visual effects. Right. And what it does is it doesn't distract you from the visual effects, it distracts you from the quality. So you can do shots in 3D which sometimes aren't as perfect as they would have to be in 2D. I know that sounds... I don't kind know that I quite. I, I don't know if I quite understand I, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'll believe you. I'll, but I'll take you one. But in two D, you're there. You're building the three D world in your head. In your head, you fill in certain you're, things. Yeah, you're doing all this stuff, and you see everything in three D. Things that are in front are in front. Things that are back and back, and you're being told where everything is in space. And it's in more a sense, it, it distracts you from uh, sometimes from the the level of expertise used in the actual creation of the visual effect. Totally. I'm not saying that's bad totally get that. because, in a sense, if you're making a 3D movie, you want it to distract you from the visual. You want it to be an immersive 3D experience where you go in and you feel the story is has you're in the you center of it, and you're in the center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you worked on Avatar, and I think Avatar yeah. really succeeds in that way, yeah. and and the 3D is part of the world, yeah. and and the, the, it's part of the metaphor of right. the story itself is that it's dimensional. It's right. interesting, when Avatar was released, which was December of 2009. I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, was it 2010? 2009. Uh, the, um, the stereo, you know, the 2i 3D aspect of it, yeah. was not pushed very far. They, Jim was, Cameron was quite, uh, you know, he understood that he was making a two and a half, three hour movie. And that for two and a half or three hours, you didn't want to, stress anybody's eyeballs. Mm -hmm. uh, and also he felt that this was a storytelling device and something to bring people more into the story and more into that, that world of Thank Pandora. You, yeah. and, and he wanted that to be a comfortable experience all the way through. So when it got released, everybody I talked to who was making a 3D movie said, it has to be like Avatar, it has to be like Avatar. Fast forward a few years, Hugo gets released, Hugo broke a lot of rules, a lot of 3D rules. Right. It pushed depth where it was illogical. Uh -huh. It did a lot of things that you, that a lot of people in this business, they have rules. 3D is a belief system. Yes. Because it's subjective. Right. And so everybody has a belief as to what is the right way to do it and what is the right look for it. And you can have 10 people in a yeah. room looking at a brilliant 3D shot, and they will all disagree about what it's good about, what bad about. Of course. They it's the way we see it's the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Different people see 3D different. Sure. So it's, it's a crazy, wacky belief thing. Well, uh, Marty Scorsese and his DP and his visual effects guy, Rob Legato, really pushed the 3D in Hugo. And they made it. In many ways, they pushed it beyond where normally you would expect it to break, and it didn't. 
it actually looked pretty good. That is extremely and, skillful. And it was amazingly That's skillful. That's extremely this was an skillful. Incredibly well made movie. Right. I mean, people. I don't think people understand just how well made. And and, and and how skilled Scorsese yeah. is to to, to 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 make that all work together. Right. And and to push logic that way. Right. Like we said before, visual effects is about. Well, stretching our logic yeah. and, and and making things happen that 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 logically can't happen. Right. But. Uh, it's a, it's a fine line, isn't yeah. it? It's yeah. a, I mean, you're it's creating a, things yeah. that you if you can't photograph them, and then you're trying to create them, you have to you you know you I need know. that suspension of disbelief. You need to make sure that everything is working within the story, so the audience just continues to watch the story and isn't worried about what the camera's doing or what the background looks like or what, you know. So, uh, but with Hugo, that the 3D was was pushed in a way that was extreme, and it worked. And it worked for me, and I'm a huge critic of too much 3D. And, yeah. and I thought it was fantastic. I thought the 3D was beautiful. So now, when you talk to people about a movie, they say, oh, it has to look like Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. So uh, before, it had to look like Avatar. Now it has to look like Hugo. Well, it's, you know. great that we're pushing our, our perspective and our, our view of the world and what, what our art is and uh, mm -hmm. pushing the technology. It is, it is an art and a science, right? you know? Um, um, uh, so, you know, the, the, the future about where, where this is all going, uh, I, I read something that you wrote, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, okay? And I'm, I'm going to quote you here, okay? <laughs> you were talking about the future yeah. uh, of, 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 well, of here we are, you know, right? And, and, right? So it's 12 years after that, but... Uh, it's interesting that uh, all these tricks that you're able to do, that a point that you make uh, in this article that you wrote is that in the future, uh, that perhaps we can f start to fix one of the, the, the most basic things about movie making, which is continuity. Mm -hmm. And that uh, now you can fix the time of day when the lighting isn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, we always met, wait for magic hour. You, know, you can create that in post. Uh, uh, you can add a pen that perhaps the actor forgot to pick up mm -hmm. at a certain time mm -hmm. uh, or, or something like that. You can fix the hair even. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, uh, you can, anything like you, you can. You money and take that time. Uh, but I don't know. I just thought that that was an interesting yeah. point uh, to yeah. make. It's what interesting if, because I did work on a film in 1998 Lethal Weapon 4, yeah. where most of the job was fixing continuity error. That's interesting. There were only 80 shots in the whole movie. But the film, the way the film had to be shot, it, the script wasn't complete when we started shooting. Uh -huh. So that as we shot, scenes we had shot suddenly didn't have that character in it anymore. Okay. So, because if you if you put the movie together in continuity, is that just a grab bad script supervisor? <laughs> no, 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 no. There was no script. Oh, I see. I see. So we would get script yeah. pages a day ahead of time. S script supervisor wasn't even able to do the their day. job. No. Yeah. So yeah. The script supervisor can't say that character can't be there because he got right, shot right. and he died in the previous scene. The previous scene hadn't been shot yet and wasn't written. So then, when they wrote the scene, then he shot and died. Then Dick would go back and say. We need to add this. Mike, you got to take this guy out yeah, of the yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Or you got to add this guy into the shot. So there was a lot of that. So I'd done that two or three years before I wrote that. Um, and yeah, that's a power that you can that we have now with visual effects. We we still can't relight a photograph scene. I, you can change it hugely. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, if I'm looking at you and I see the key light over there and I see that light wrapping around your face like that, uh -huh. and I was shooting you from here. And somebody said, no, make the key light come from over here. As yet, we cannot change that. Well, you can do it, but you'll turn into a CG creature. I mean, you right. will be computer right. graphic at that point, because I will have to light a computer graphic model to create the light on the side. So I make a model of you, and then, then I have to reproject you onto that model. I have to put a light over there to get that light. I, have to, I mean, there's a lot going on. And that means we have to do it, and then you get into animation. You get, so generally, relighting is more kind of like at the at its extreme is kind of an extreme adjustment. Mm -hmm, you, know, mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. flatten things out when they're a little too contrasty. You can contrast them up when they're a little too flat. You can do that kind of stuff. But you're not, I hope, you know, when we get into the point where we have to relight something, then it's better just go shoot it again. What are your feelings about creating life? Uh, 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 making things 
seem real and alive. Now, you directed something uh, back in the, the 60s, so a Coca-Cola commercial. Yeah, it was 90s. one of the first. Oh, I'm sorry, in the 90s. It feels me. like the 60s. Uh, it feels like, well, maybe it looks kind of like Except the I 60s. Wasn't high in the 90s. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think you were talking about that this this Coca-Cola commercial uh, has a very uh, has a fr one of the first animated furry yeah, creatures. Yeah, we we who worked on the commercial like to think that it was the first public sort of exhibition of a computer graphic animated creature with fur. Um, and render power was hugely limited back then. Fur right, was right. Render intensive. Yes. And um, individual hairs. Individual yeah. hairs. Yeah. No matter how you generate those hairs, whether they're particles or geometry or whatever the technique is, you make the hairs. It takes a lot of them. It takes a lot of them. <laughs> right. You got to multiply yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And everyone's delight lit. It all. They each cast a shadow on each other. They do. You know. They it's like it's a crazy amount of lighting. Sure. Um, so, it, back then, to to render, we did this at Rhythm and Hughes. There were. I took it to three places. First of all, nobody, I was brought the boards, and the guy who brought me the boards said, what do you think? And I said, it'd be great to do a computer graphic bear. And this was 93. Nobody was wow. doing that. You know? Wow. And, uh, and he said, you're kidding, right? You, you can do that? And I said, yeah, we can do that. Did nobody you know that you could it. do that? I was pretty you confident. You were pretty confident. I was pretty right, confident, but nobody had done it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. all the tools were there. We yeah. were ready. And it was going to happen in a commercial before it happened in a feature. There were um, sort of things done. Rhythm and Hughes, who did the commercial, had done some, some um, additions and stuff to cats and things in a couple of uh -huh, uh -huh. that were where they'd done some CG first. So there were some attempts in features. But anyway, there was nothing quite like this with a, a character who sort of had to carry the commercial. And uh, so I said, no, we're going to do it. So I took it to three places. I took it to ILM. Uh, where the, uh, everybody used to have a commercial division, all the effects uh -huh, uh -huh. They don't now, but they used to. Um, Rhythm and Hughes, ILM, and a company called PDI, which is now DreamWorks Animation. Oh. Uh, and they were the only three that could do furry critters in 1993 that I knew of. Uh, and they could get this done in the time we had. So um, I took it to them, and the ILM turned it down. They weren't interested. Mm -hmm. They looked at it and went, oh, I don't know, Mike, it's, uh, that's a lot, you know. PDI sent me a test and said, this is the kind of, this is what we can do, and it was terrible. And it wasn't that they couldn't do terrible, they did terrible, they did brilliant work, but their technology was not generating a furry creature that I thought was believable. Mm -hmm. And so I went, and it doesn't have to be photo real, it just had to be believable. There's a, you had to feel it. There's a famous computer graphic guy named Jim, James Blinn, Jim Blinn, uh -huh. who was at Jet Propulsion Lab and, and now works at Microsoft. And he's, he's the guy that made it possible for us to build a CG object, put it on a tabletop, and make it look like it's actually sitting there lit by the same light. He wrote some of the initial code oh, wow. that generated that. Wow. And Jim said many years ago, it doesn't have to be real, it just has to look real. That's a, that's and, a great... That's a great and statement. To, to make something, to make it be real in computer graphics is way too expensive. Right. But to make it look real, costs less. Yeah, sure. It looks great. So we were in that realm with the bear. Anyway, Rhythm and Hughes was willing to take it on. We took it to Rhythm and Hughes. A 30 second, 720 by 486 video res spot in 1993 took the entire facility to render in four days. Nothing else got rendered Rhythm and Hughes for like four days. Wow, wow. Or, it took all of their resources, all, all, of their, resources. all their computers and all of that. Right. We are running out of time. Uh, I, I wish we had more time to talk because then 20 years later, you get an Academy Award for, for polar bears with armor. Right. And, right. <laughs> and One of the producers on the film said to me, took me out to dinner when we were in pre-production on the movie. Right, right. On Golden Compass and said, Mike, who did the polar bear spot? And I said, oh, I did the first one. She said, oh, that figures. <laughs> that was the end there of is, that. There is a continuity to a, to a great career. Uh -huh. uh, this, has been, this has been enlightening. Uh, I, I've learned a lot. I wish, uh, I, I'd like to ask you to come back because uh, I'd love to talk to you uh, more. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Kelvin Han Yee. I'd like to thank 
Michael Fink for being here. Thank you so Elvin, much. Thank you. This has been Creative Current on LAArtStream.com. Good night.